Hi everyone, welcome back to another Wonderland session. This is Wonderland session number 13. And this is a very different kind of Wonderland session because in the past, it's basically all been about Abraham Hicks. And Abraham Hicks teachings really transformed my life back in November of last year. And we're now in March, so it's been a big chunk of time. However, this past weekend, I was in San Jose at Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within. And it was completely life-changing. This is not an exaggeration. This is not hyperbole. This is not me overstating the point. It was completely life-changing. And the most amazing thing about it is that Tony teaches what Abraham Hicks teaches too. Just from a different perspective, a different type of language, and a different way of teaching. And so I was blown away, completely inspired, completely transformed, and I want to share with you today some of the things that I learned, some of the things that I discovered while I was there, and give you um, a fresh take on what I've been talking about with Abraham Hicks for the past 13 sessions, or past 12 sessions. And I think this will really help you maybe see things from a different perspective. Maybe if you're a little bit sick of the Abraham stuff, this will give you some fresh inspiration and fresh motivation. And there, it's amazing how beautifully compatible these two methodologies, these two schools of thought are. They're really beautifully compatible. They help one another. They strengthen one another. And um, that was really exciting for me. I love finding when things interplay easily with other beautiful things, and that's really exciting to me. So I'm going to share with you some of what occurred. So we were at Unleash the Power Within in San Jose. There were 12,000 people there. I'm going to say that again. There were 12,000 people in the audience. We were in a stadium. We were in a stadium with multiple screens, live cameras swinging over the audience, giving us different takes, different angles on Tony on the stage, different angles on the audience. There was guys roaming around with cameras on their shoulder, filming the crowd. There was smoke on the stage. There was lights. There was loud, thundering, fucking fantastic music. It was next level. And I mean, I have loved Tony Robbins for a really long time. Even when I was a very cynical goth, I would see his infomercials on television and be like, that guy has something and that seems really cool. And I would, I think I said this in the last session, I would, when I got my first, well, not my first job, my second job ever, where I worked at a bookshop, I would like go to the self-help section and pick up his books and try to secretly read them when there were no customers around. So I've always loved his stuff. And you know, his videos that he makes um, and all the stuff that he has on YouTube is really, really valuable, helpful material. And I love him because I feel that in a lot of ways, he's like me. It's not about theory, fuck the theory. If there are no tactics, if there are no tools, if there are no techniques, I'm not interested. I want results and that's it. I don't care what the theory is if it doesn't work, right? And that is how he is too. So I love seeing him in person and I have to say, I had very high expectations for what he would be like and he completely over-delivered. He showed up in the biggest way possible. He's 58 years old. He's been doing this for 40 years, and he still has the passion, the enthusiasm, the energy of someone who just began. And even in saying that, it's almost like unfair to make that comparison because I've never seen anyone with as much energy, as much passion, as much enthusiasm as him. He was on stage for 13 hours at a time. And when I say on stage for 13 hours at a time, I don't mean like 13 hours and a lunch break, 13 hours and a pee break. No, he was literally on stage for 13 hours without a break. I was like, is he wearing a catheter so he can pee while he's on stage and we don't know? It was fucking mind blowing. I have literally never seen anything like it and I don't think I will ever see anything like it in my time on this planet again. It was absolutely incredible. 
And one of the most amazing and fabulous things about seeing someone do that, seeing someone be on for 13 hours consistently, is it proves to you that you can do it too. And not just by watching his example, but by taking the experiences and the exercises that he gave us and really applying them and practicing them and doing them ourselves. We were on our feet for like four hours at a time, six hours at a time, and you, we weren't tired, we were excited, we were amped, we were pumped, we were screaming at the top of our lungs. Everyone there by the fourth day pretty much was hoarse, couldn't speak anymore, and the great thing is like we weren't even tired, we were like psyched on life. Because the more energy you create in your body, the more you have to go around. It lasts, it's sustaining. You're not getting your energy from sugar or coffee or some other outside source, some like Red Bull or some shit like that. You are creating your own energy source. That is one of the things he taught us to do this weekend. And I don't know if you can tell from the pace in which I am talking and the amount of hand gestures I'm making, but I took that shit to heart. I have been using it, it feels amazing. I woke up this morning and I did the priming exercises that he taught us um, on, I think, the first or the second day. And I was like screaming with delight into my bed covers, actually, because I didn't want to upset my neighbors. But I think tomorrow I'm just going to scream out loud because fuck it. And it feels really, really good. And I have been in what he calls a peak state all morning long. I've been up since 8 o'clock. It's now 2 p.m. I have been on a fucking wave the whole time. So, this may sound familiar to you, right? This might sound like what we've been talking about with Abraham Hicks. Abraham Hicks says the same thing, except it's a little bit more gentle of an approach. They talk about feeling good. They talk about being in the vortex. They talk about making sure that you feel good before you do anything. So, feel good and then is what they say, right? They talk about getting yourself into that state where you feel really good and doing it through gratitude, through journaling, through listening to music, through exercise. Literally, that is what Tony talks about too. That is what he taught us to do. And the great thing about Unleash the Power Within, and by the way, this is not a sales pitch. I like, this is not a sales pitch, but if it piques your interest at all, please go. It will really blow your mind. But that is what Tony talks about too. And at the event, we didn't just hear about it. It wasn't just him talking at us for four days. He would tell us something and then we would do it. And we would do it over and over and over again. We drilled it. We conditioned ourselves to get into that state quickly. He always says, how quickly can you get into that state? Like that, it's that fast. You can get into it immediately. And the only reason for not getting into it is because you're making excuses or you're not following the techniques. So, it was pretty amazing. And all of his techniques were really embodied. It wasn't about theory, it wasn't about talking, it wasn't about being in your head. It was fully embodied shit and it was so fucking good. So on the first night, the first night, everybody walks across burning hot coals. Barefoot, barefoot, these little feet. I walked across burning hot coals like a fucking boss and it didn't feel painful. It didn't hurt. It felt amazing. Afterwards, I was completely exhilarated and it proved to me the power of the fucking mind, not just as a theory, but in practical application. If you can walk across burning hot coals with bare feet and not be in pain and be exhilarated at the end, what else can you do? Literally anything. There are no limits. And that is what was reinforced to us all weekend long. And fuck, it was so good. Okay, so I'm gonna get into some of the things that he taught us that I think dovetail really nicely with the Abraham Hicks stuff, with manifestation, with feeling good, right? Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. So the first thing that he says is that emotion is caused by motion. I'm going to say that again. Emotion, how you feel, is caused by motion, what you do with your body. And there is a triangle of things that we do that put us into either a good state or a shitty state. And it's honestly really that simple. You're either living in a beautiful state or you're suffering. A beautiful state being gratitude, happiness, excitement, anticipation, joy, love, ecstasy, pleasure, feeling good, feeling calm, feeling creative, feeling abundant, all of that is a beautiful state. 
Suffering is anything that is not those things. Worrying, complaining, feeling sad, feeling tired, feeling confused, feeling inactive, feeling stagnant, not being sure what to do, being angry, being resentful, being envious. All of that is suffering and it's optional. We don't have to stay there. And I've talked about this in previous videos. There's so much information about this. If you Google Tony Robbins t suffering, there's heaps of stuff that he has said about this as well. If you wanna learn more about how to not suffer, it's really good shit, I love it. But we have these three things. There's three things that we do that can put us into great states or shitty states. And the three things are this, physiology, meaning what we do with our body, Focus, meaning what we do with our mind, and language, meaning the words that we say, either out loud or in our minds. So there's a lot of um, examples online of videos on YouTube where he will be in an audience and he'll explain this concept and then he'll have somebody stand up who's been suffering from depression. And he'll be like, how depressed are you feeling on a scale of one to 10? And they'll tell him, and it's usually like a seven or an eight, it's pretty high. And then he'll say to them, but are you really feeling depressed right now? And they're like, no, like in the moment, you know, I'm feeling okay because I'm in the seminar and stuff. But, you know, when I leave the seminar, I, you know, I feel shitty. And he's like, okay, show me, like, get depressed for me right now. Do that for me. And they will stand in the audience and you watch their body language change. Their head will drop. Their shoulders will come up. They'll contract. They might cross their arms across themselves. If they're really in a state of stress or anxiety, they might put their hands on their face or on their head. They might put their hands over their mouth. You know, their complete physiology changes. Their posture changes. And then you th he asks them, you know, what's happening with your focus? What are you thinking about? And they're thinking about, you know, times that they've failed, things that haven't gone well. They're living in the past. They're obsessing about things that didn't work out before. And then he'll ask them, what language are you using? What are you saying in your mind? And it's usually like, I'm a piece of shit. I can't believe I fucked that up. How could I do that? What's wrong with me, etc., cetera, et cetera. And so the idea is that whatever you're doing with your physiology, your focus and your language is what will create your state. So if you think about that, I want you to think about the times when you feel depressed or sad. What does it look like in your body? So for me, it looks like this. My shoulders come up, I lean forward, I get small, I compress my body. And so next time that you are feeling that way, I want you to just notice what you're doing and notice that it's so easy to change it by simply noticing what's going on and changing those things, literally changing your posture, changing what you're thinking about, changing the things that you say to yourself. So there's a lot more about that. That's a really big topic all on its own. But I wanted to just bring that up because I know that a lot of people watching me do suffer with depression from time to time or it's something that has been an ongoing struggle for them. And I want you to just notice your physiology when you're doing it. And even if you just change your physiology, your posture, when you're feeling sad, when you're feeling bummed out, when you're feeling unsure, things will start to change within your body. So that was the first thing that I wanted to say, just a little tidbit that I think is really helpful and really beautiful. And it's simple, right? Like the stuff is not rocket science, but it is fucking useful and completely true and scientifically proven. Okay, so the second thing that I wanted to talk about today is basically everything that Tony Robbins teaches is predicated on the fact that as humans, we have six basic needs. And I'm gonna go through all six of them and we're gonna talk about what they are, how we meet these needs, and how this stuff can keep us in places we don't wanna be or how we can use it to help us get to where we wanna go. So the six human needs are, well, there's four human needs and there's two spiritual needs. So it's a group of six. So the first human need is certainty. So certainty, let me just grab this workbook here. I have a huge workbook full of notes. 
So certainty and safety is the first human need. So that is about knowing that things are stable, right? Think about how stressful it is when you don't know where you're going to sleep or you don't know where your next meal is going to come from or you're unsure whether your relationship is on solid ground or you don't know how much money you have in the bank or when your next job is coming in, right? That's extremely stressful. And so we all have that need for certainty. We want to make sure that things are stable and secure and safe in our lives. So um, that is, um, that's kind of about our fear of pain, right? Nobody wants to be in pain. And when we feel uncertain about things, it often creates a lot of pain. And so that is our first human need. Our first human need is certainty. Now, our sixth, second human need is interesting because it is the paradox of the first, which is the need for uncertainty, also known as the need for variety, right? So if you eat the same food every day, you're going to get bored. If you sleep with the same person your entire life, you're probably going to get bored too, no matter how amazing they are. We all need variety. We don't just listen to one musician, watch one movie over and over again, walk down the same street for the rest of our lives. We love novelty. We love variety. We love uncertainty. It makes it fun for us, right? That's kind of the spice of life in a lot of ways. So we also have this need for uncertainty. Okay. The third need that we have is significance. So that's the need to feel important. And we do that in all kinds of ways. Maybe by feel like having a sense of superiority, maybe by having rose quartz hair, maybe by covering ourselves in tattoos, maybe by putting ourselves into a public kind of public facing career. But it can also be choosing to have children and really needing to feel needed. That's a way of feeling significant. Other ways to feel significant could be to be a really high level achiever or to be someone who um, is always VIP or someone who is always, um, you know, knows all the most important th people or, you know, has lots of connections or whatever. We meet these needs for significance in lots of different ways. Um, so that is the third human, third human need. And the fourth human need is, again, the paradox of that one, which is the need for love and connection. So we all want to feel loved, understood, worthy, connected. We want to talk to people. We want to have them understand us. We want to feel comforted by them. We want to feel welcomed. We want to have friendships. And we don't want to feel alone because literally feeling alone and being separated from the pack feels like death. That's why it's so difficult for people who feel lonely. It literally feels like they're dying because our brains are not wired to be alone. Our brains are wired to be with the pack. So those are our four human needs. And I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail in a second of the ways that we meet these and how they can drive us. But just for now, certainty, uncertainty, significance, love and connection, right? Those are our four human needs. Now, our two spiritual needs are growth, meaning you're evolving, things are changing, you're not staying the same, you're not stagnating, you change your hair, or you take a new course, or you learn better communication skills, or you grow your business, or you, um, anything that you change, anything like that is growth. And then the, although this says here, which is very nice, people are not spiritually satisfied unless their capacities are expanding. So that's a really good way of defining growth. And then the sixth the human need is the need for contribution. So the need to feel like you're giving back, you're helping other people, you're adding some value to the planet. That is our sixth human need. And we, like I said, every single person has all six of these needs, right? Nobody is exempt from this. It's, it's present in absolutely every single one of us. However, we all have two needs that drive us more than the others. So we will find a way to meet every single one of these needs. Every single one of us finds a way to meet every single one of these needs. But there are two that we prioritize over others, and that's kind of where things can become a little bit dicey. For example, if your need for certainty and your need for significance are your top two needs, you will have a lot of pain in your life. Because when you need certainty, you're so uncomfortable with change. 
You absolutely can't stand it. It makes you feel crazy. It makes you feel out of control and it brings you so much fear. And of course that doesn't work long term because the only constant in life is change. And then if your other need is to feel significant, if that's your one of your two most driving needs is to feel significant and important and special, then it kind of cancels out your ability to feel love and connection. Because needing to feel significant is about alienating yourself from other people and separating yourself. So every time that you do that, which is your way of making yourself feel special and different and cool and whatever, you're cutting off that ability to really connect with people, to really feel love, to really be vulnerable and have a true connection with somebody else. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. So we all find ways to meet these needs, positive and negative, um, you know, obtainable or sustainable. So Obtainable stuff is the easy ways that we get significance. So an easy way to get significance is like get covered in tattoos. So every time you leave the house, people talk to you about your tattoos and you feel special, right? That's one way that you can do that. But a more um, sustainable way of feeling significant is to create something in the world that really makes people feel good or that adds to the world, right? That's a way that you can feel significant too. And you can help feel significant by helping other people. And that's a way that it's more sustainable. So what we can do is think about um, the ways that we meet these needs and think like, if this way of meeting my need is only serving me, then it's not sustainable. And what we really want to do is find a way to meet these needs that brings us more pleasure than pain. So I'm going to go through these needs and the way that we meet them in positive and negative ways. And if you want to make notes on this, you're more than welcome to. I would love for you to do that, in fact, and start thinking about Um, you know, what you do to meet these needs and maybe what that is looking like in your life right now. So here, I'm going to read out what I wrote down. So it basically says like, what are the ways that you get certainty and what are the ways that you get uncertainty? So some of this is a little bit deeper than I got into with you right now, but I think you're going to get the gist. So here are some of the positive ways that I create certainty in my own life. Um, Working out, having morning routines, working in my business, maintaining friendships, and also being on social media, right? That's a way that I can feel certainty. I I know when I put something out, I'm going to get something back, and that can be a really positive thing. But here are some of the negative ways that I can get certainty. I can get certainty by being angry, by getting pissed off, and by flying off the handle. That's a way that I can feel certain, because when you're angry, you're convinced that your way is right and nobody else's is, so it's a way that you meet that need for certainty. You can also meet your need for certainty by being controlling, by asking your partner, where are you going? What are you doing? Needing to know every single detail. Being controlling of your relationship is a negative way that we can meet that need for certainty. Being selfish is another way that we can feel certainty. Being defensive is another way that we can feel certain. And picking fights with our friends, our family, our lovers is another way that we can feel certain within ourselves. It brings us that sense of security and safety where we know we're right. And so we're meeting that need for certainty, but it's not in a positive way. Does that make sense? Okay. So here are some of the ways that we can get uncertainty, right? And um, I did a test on TonyRobbins.com a few months ago where it tested you on all six of these needs and it t- told you which, number, which was number one for you. And my number one was actually uncertainty. My need for uncertainty is greater than all of my others. So um, here are some of the ways that I meet my needs for uncertainty in a positive way. Traveling, being creative, dating, going to parties and socializing, again, social media, because when I put things out, I also don't know what's going to come back and I get to be creative and artistic. It's another way. Um, Taking classes and learning. So those are just a sample of some ways that I can get uncertainty, which is also known as variety in my life. It's how I keep my life spicy. I keep it interesting. Um, You know, going on adventures and, and researching new places to go and then going to them and having new experiences. I do this kind of thing all the time because my need for uncertainty is really, really massive. However, there are some negative ways that I meet my needs for uncertainty as well. So here's what I wrote down. Shopping. Like, that's not always a bad thing, but when you feel like 
you're bored in your life and you and you're over shopping then that can be a negative for sure another way that you can meet your need for uncertainty is by worrying because you're focusing on things that you can't control so it keeps your heart like this all the time and nothing feels good so you can meet your needs for uncertainty by worrying you can also meet your needs for uncertainty by not planning by picking fights and again, social media. For me, social media was in every single portion of this. It hit every single human need on both the positive and negative side, which is why social media is so fucking hard to step away from even when you really, really want to. It meets so many of our needs. And when something meets three of our needs, it's an addiction. Okay. Next section is significance. So here are some of the positive ways that I find significance in my life. Helping other people, dressing up, being creative, speaking to crowds of people, getting tattoos. And some of the negative ways that I get a sense of significance, also known as like, how do I feel important? How do I get attention? How do I um, feel special? Having problems. Having problems is so big for all of us. Having problems is an amazing way to feel significant. It's also a really major way that we can feel a sense of love and connection, not just to other people, because you notice when you have a problem, people come out of the woodwork, they wanna help you get a lot of attention, but it also helps you connect to yourself. And you don't always do that with a lot of reliability. So sometimes having a problem is a way of having that sense of connection to who you are. It's just a shitty way of doing it and there are better ways of doing it. So, negative ways that I get significance in my life. Problems, having a sense of self-pity, feeling sad, feeling angry, having mood swings, and picking fights. Mm. Oh yeah, beautiful. Okay, and then this last um, section is, we're only gonna go through four of these human needs because the growth and contribution ones are pretty clear. But the love and connection piece, um, the positive ways that I meet my needs for love and connection are friendships, my relationship, creativity, like being a good listener, being present, being helpful. And then on the negative side of that, we have self-pity, anger, bad moods, not sharing my thoughts, playing small. You ever notice that playing small means sometimes you get more love from people? Um, yes. So that is what I've got in both columns for each area and I would love for you to sit down and write this down for yourself and kind of make a list of what are the ways that I'm meeting these needs in my life and both the positive and negative side and when you do that it will become really clear to you what your top two drivers are so for some people they might be having a great time they might be mostly driven by growth and love and connection or something like that which is fantastic but a lot of people a lot of people are primarily driven by their needs for certainty or safety and significance and i promise you that if those are the things that you prioritize over everything else it will really only bring you pain and misery in the long term. You might get like those quick hits of feeling good, but over time it'll start to degrade. It's not sustainable. It's not going to feel good to you. So think about what your top two have been and then ask yourself, once you figure that out, it's a really good question. What has that cost you? So if, for example, your needs have been certainty and significance, what has that cost you? If your need for certainty has meant that you have controlled your partners, has it driven them away? Like, let's look realistically at what's going on with you and what you've done to meet these needs that has had consequences, negative consequences in your life. So sit down and do some journaling on that. Think about that because this is really real shit. And when you can be truly honest with yourself about these things, then you can start to make changes. But until we can really look at what's going on with us, we really don't have that ability. So it's important that we just take the time to be honest with ourselves. And it's cool. Like no one ever has to look at what you've journaled. You never have to share it with anyone. Nobody has to know. But you will know for yourself and then you'll be able to do something about it. So once you've determined what your two driving needs are and what those have cost you, you then are going to ask yourself, 
what top two needs would transform your life? And if you did use those top two needs as a way of driving yourself, how would that transform your life? What would your life look like if you changed that up? So that is a little exercise for you today. And over the coming weeks, I'm gonna teach you about how we can do this. How do we change our needs? How do we meet our needs in different ways? Ways that are more positive, ways that are more sustainable, ways that feel good, ways that make us proud to be who we are. But I need you to do this exercise first. So that is all for today's Wonderland session. I hope it was helpful, it was inspiring. And not just inspiring, but I hope that it woke something up within you that you then are gonna sit down and write some shit and like get really clear on what's going on and i will be back here next week same time and i'm really excited to help you change these patterns meet these needs in different ways this is how we are really and truly going to change our lives and it's going to be awesome. I'm really excited for you to do this. Please do it. Leave me a comment below on YouTube once it's done. Let me know. And if you want to talk about your results, you are more than welcome to do it. I would love to hear what's going on for you. And then next week we can really jump into it. We can really go deep and we can really like fix some shit up. It's going to be so fucking good. Oh my God. I can't wait. So thank you again for joining me. I love you. I'm going to go to the gym. Holler back. I'm not going to wear my sequin jacket because unfortunately it's way too cold for that. But I'm going to work out. I love you. Have a beautiful week. I will see you next week.